lockdown. We are all safe at home, and uh, we are very happy to have you back today in the Zoom meeting. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today, I'm very happy to welcome uh, the world-renowned LASIK cataract and corneal surgeon, Dr. Arun C. Gulani, the founding director and chief surgeon of Gulani Vision Institute, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Gulani, for uh, uh, accepting our invitation to, yeah, to join us virtually for this meeting. And uh, I, rem I still remember two years back in Arvind Pondicherry, where you so passionately taught us about the corneoplastics, uh, the principles and the 5S algorithm. And I'm sure uh, everyone is going to appreciate how good a teacher you are. And today's topic, especially on pterygium surgeries, uh, I'm sure it will be more appealing for um, many ophthalmologists because it is not refined to the cornea specialist, especially in India. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll have a totally new outlook on how to approach a pterygium surgery, more like a refractive surgery. And uh, thank you once again, doctor, over to you. First of all, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, I have wonderful memories, actually. 2017, when I was speaking at your um, institute, it was an amazing experience. So thank you, Dr. Venkatesh, and uh, all of you. I still remember lots of you. So we'll go through uh, my concepts of pterygium surgery and the, con and the topics that we'll uh, review. It's actually dividing into three sections. Uh, each section actually is a four-hour instructional course, but we'll complete all of it with enough time for questions, all right? So I'll have a share screen right now. Let me know if you can see everything. Can you see? Uh, we are not seeing the screen yet, sir. Can you uh, share your screen now? Oh, this is the YouTube one on the side then. All right. Can you see now? Not it, doctor. Not yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we're able to see. Now? Yes, yes, you can go ahead. Okay, okay lovely. So um, we'll start uh, talking about pterygium. Uh, obviously, I know a lot of you here, and um, I do know all of you are wonderful surgeons. So my concept of teaching always takes you into concepts, which is how to plan, and outcomes, which is the most important thing we must plan, and then surgery just happens. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna talk about what my desires are, what's in my mind when I'm operating. And uh, really the concept is, I don't want you to think about driving, I want you to think about the destination and make the drive a fun, keep the music loud, you know, have fun in a nice car, look at the scenery. That's the concept of surgery to me. Do not get so involved in changing the gears and all that stuff that you lose the scenery and the destination. So particular to my heart, pterygium surgery is now uh, 21 years with this technique that I've done, uh, white papers and publication, but the whole point here is to raise it to a cosmetic level. Cosmetic level for following reasons. I'll give you an analogy of refractive surgery in this all the time, which is patient requests, which is uh, very important that drives us, and then expectations and your own satisfaction. So first, as I said, uh, wonderful memories of being at your uh, institute and uh, you know this lovely gift that you uh, gave me, I still have it adorning, as you can see in my living room right there, which is right here where I'm sitting right now. So it's a real pleasure. This is a book where I've shared my lifetime's work on Terrigium. It's uh, by theme publishers, no financial interest. You can go online, amazon.com, et cetera, and get it. And I'm going to go through all the things that I've written here with some wonderful uh, co-authors. First and foremost, I want you to look at this picture and understand that these are today's patients. Uh, they want the best, they expect the best, and you must also live up to that expectation. So this is today's uh, most important slide. Uh, of course, this is my patient, uh, uh, Tracy. Uh, all of them absolutely want to look great. To me, there's no such thing as a small problem. If the patient is complaining, it's a problem. Uh, we should know how to fix it. So these are actually patients of pingecula, if you can imagine, not pterygium. The small little thing that many doctors say, don't worry about it, take the drops, don't be vain. 
it's not vanity. These patients actually are visually affected in the fact that they are self-conscious, they have a low self-esteem because they're always wondering, what is someone who's looking at my eyes thinking? Why is my eyes so red? So even pingecula is an intense thing, actually, the eighth reason people fly to me. So you can imagine how much it bothers people. It's just that they haven't told you well enough or you haven't listened well enough. So pingecula is where we'd go also. Now, these are day one patients, uh, all of them, different uh, ages, uh, sex uh, from all over the world. And this is the appearance you want. Their eyes need to be absolutely sparkling white, painless, smiling before they fly out. So again, please focus on the slide. I want you to look at or imagine this outcome even before you start your surgery. These are patients, uh, this study in particular that we are uh, sent out for publication, the 18 years follow-up. These are again, doctors, lawyers, but you can see their uh, facial expressions, which to me is my driving factor. All of you know, uh, the way I, I practice, I have let all my patients go on social media and share what they feel. To me, that is the most highest level of accountability. No other thing can match it. No, no spot on a scattergram or a graph can show you really how the patient feels. And these are patients, again, high IQ, very demanding, but for them to go on social media and share or take pictures with you is the only testimony of success. So please look at this again. Now, this is how patients document their success nowadays. Uh, again, these are all of my patients. We have permission from everybody, but you can see how they document their success. You see that man on the right, he's got, you know, before or after picture. This is how they go on social media and write about how they feel. And really, it changes their lives. So pterygium, pingecula, ocular surface surgery is really important. And it's extremely important that we take it to a cosmetic level because you are changing their lives. So even patients with lateral pterygium, again, I'm first showing you a few things so you can get uh, acclimatized and actually I want you to be addicted to how your patients look next day. So you can see a patient with lateral pterygium also, same outcome. Patients with extreme recurrent surgery or pterygiums of many times when they fly in, you still want the same out outcome. You do not decrease your guard. You want perfect cosmesis, real excellent vision, no pain, and that's our goal. Uh, when I teach premium cataract surgery or premium refractive surgery, the bigger thing that I insist doctors understand is it's not just about the lens. That's the biggest mistake that's going on all over the world when I speak on these topics. Doctors are always asking which lens. Um, I'm doing premium surgery. Well, by putting a special lens in just because it's multifocal or something doesn't make it premium in any level. It's just an ingredient. Actually, for fun, because I'm home, I made a video on social media, I don't know how many of you have seen it, where I explained premium surgery like cooking as a master chef. You don't just focus on one ingredient, you plan the recipe. The recipe starts with ambience, how you approach the patient, the place where you work, how do you treat the patient, how comfortable are they, how confident are they, then surgery takes off and you land at your outcome. So this is the surgical suite of design and that's Patient comfort is most important to me. In a quick nutshell, I'm sharing with you in one slide the cycle of a patient. Again, this is one particular patient I just picked because of the cycle. Um, you can see me meeting with them before surgery, um, right there on the sofa in my surgical suite. I meet with them before surgery, sit down, again, review with them, having already met them when they fly in. Then you're seeing in surgery, even though I always have people watching or coming in uh, to observe surgeons, industry, you do not want to disturb the patient. You are okay with everybody watching, but you are focused on the patient. The patient and you are one. That's very important. Again, that's what's premium. And the goal that you have here is where you're taking the patient. You can see immediate post-surgery, how patients react with thumbs ups and laughing and coming out laughing. Immediately after surgery, they take a picture or they want to put up a selfie. These are patients of today. You cannot stop that. You cannot avoid that. So might as well enjoy it. It's fun. And they want that to show their families why they flew to this distance. You can see the smiles on their faces. It shows you the gratitude, it makes it more interesting, more gratifying for you to do these surgeries at the cosmetic level. Uh, also, these surgeries come with a very high price because price for the doctor, I mean, because while these patients are taking pictures with you going on social media, telling the world how great you are, they're also policing you all the time. 
You can imagine, I say this every time, even a plastic surgeon has it easy because if he makes a mistake, you just cover it up with clothes. But with the eye, pterygium pingicular surgery, you make one mistake, you make the patient more red, it's over. So they are looking at their eye every second they breathe. They're always going up to the mirror and wondering what's that red dot? They forget that they're human and that you aim for such an excellence that their eyes are sparkling white. So again, I have not seen this to be much of a problem over the last two decades of doing this surgery that no one really calls and bothers you, but yes, they are very involved. And that's the reason they flew, remember? So they're very involved post-op. They keep looking at their eyes in the mirror. They keep thinking about how am I doing? And imagine how much you have to be accountable because they're sharing with their doctors, their families. If it even goes red a little bit, they're calling you. Now, that not that the same expectation you have in your premium care pack LASIK patients, right? If they don't reach 2020, they are concerned because they came in with a normal concept and you are taking them to excellence. So this particular patient, Tracy uh, Minneapolis, she actually, unbeknownst to me and later known to me, uh, started a complete YouTube channel with my journey with her where she came in for her first eye, then flew back for her second eye. And she would record me even when we met before surgery. So you can imagine the accountability now. You are being recorded before surgery where she goes to all my thousands of followers. Here I am with Dr. Galani and I'm still to go my surgery. I'm very excited. So imagine you have to perform. That's the point I want to drive home today. Patients are expecting. You are accountable. Why not perform anyways? So this, this is what's happening. If you see down here, another patient of mine records her eye every month and posts on Facebook. So imagine as I was joking in my recent article I've written, I said, we are being evaluated even while we are sleeping. So as a doctor today, you're being evaluated. You have to perform at that level. So enjoy the ride. Why not do it? Now, here's another fun patient. Uh, this patient of mine, I had operated 12 years ago on his left eye for pterygium. He, his doctor called me and said, hey, doc, you had a recurrence. Now, it was very hurt, hurting to me. I have had one recurrence in over 600 cases for this paper we've submitted over 18 years for this particular technique. And I was like, wow, okay, I need to see it stat. Patient walks in and I remember my patients. So I'm like, what happened? And he's like, I have a recurrence, doc, your surgery went bad. And I told him that's not the eye I operated. I operated on your left eye. That's the eye we did not operate. And we had a nice laugh and I took him for surgery and corrected him right here. So it's very important what I'm sharing with you right now is the mindset of the, doc, of the patient and the doctor. You have to be a team as you're working, only then can you take it to a level, again, analogy of your premium cataract surgery or premium laser vision surgery. Patients are expecting beyond 2020, come anything less than that is a side effect. Anything bad or side effects of visual distortion is a complication, similarly here. All of your excellent surgeons, especially, um, I know y'all are doing a lot of pterygium surgeries, but each patient, if you can take to a point where you bring them to the mirror next day, that's my desire for all of you. So I'll stop for a second now, take you to a video. I have many, many videos. Again, I'll cover everything as much as I can. Right now, I'll take you straight to one video, look at it, and then we'll go through some more slides. Can you see the video now? Can everybody see the video? Can you hear it? Yeah, we can hear the video. Audio. Yes, can you see it though? is an intriguing pathology that can present itself Hello? in various tissue distributions. Can you see the video at Dr. Mulani? Um, you can. Yeah, we are able to see the um, multi slides. You cannot see the video? No, we are not able to see the video, but we were able to hear the audio of the video. Oh, that's odd. Because you are sharing screen here. Probably it's not playing in the main screen of your laptop. It is playing on the main screen. Okay. It is. So is it uh, the screen still shared? It is. Let me do one more thing. Hold on. Yeah. Vascular now? pattern. Can you see it now? 
Uh, no, doctor, not it. Wow. Okay, hold on, because the screen is screen is uh, shared. It's saying stop sharing. Yeah. Videos are very important. I have to show you. Hmm. Yeah. No. Uh, no, you'll have to start sharing your screen now. Yeah, I have. I'm uh, not sure. Hold on one sec. Let me do this now. Now, can you see? Yeah, now we can. Lovely. All right. So I'll just take it back a little bit quick. Here we go. Ready? Can you hear and see? Yes, we are able to see. Lovely. Perfect. Pterygium is an intriguing pathology that can present itself in various tissue distributions and vascular patterns. Using the three-step technique, the pterygium can be removed following the iceberg concept with mitomycin C application and glued amniotic grafts. With this iceberg concept, we're ensuring long-term success, starting day one. In this case of pterygium, I first start with a fixation stitch, followed by delineating the entire pterygium with intralesional anesthesia. Trace the entire pterygium down to its roots, anatomically delineating, literally cutting down its tentacles as it gives way, and the entire lesion is seen as here. Peel off the corneal portion from posterior anterior movement. Everybody okay? Use a 64 blade to clear the cornea, limbus, and episclera, literally like an eraser in fast, smooth movements. Receive the amniotic graft. Place it onto the scleral area. Sweep it into place under the conjunctiva. First component of the tissue glue, delivered subamniotically in a controlled fashion. Sweep it into position. So you're also squeezing out excessive glue. Second component of the tissue glue, again subamniotic. Once again, sweep the amniotic graft and squeegee at the same time for good adherence. You can also place glue between the conjunctiva and the tenons, flattening this area as well as giving a excellent aesthetic appearance that will stay next day. Delineating the anatomy is very important. Clearing the medial rectus, very important. Using a blade, I now, using a single sweep movement, cut down the excessive amniotic graft along the limbus in a controlled fashion deep enough to cut the amniotic graft, but not the cornea. No cutting As the you cornea. Can see here. You don't want to induce any astigmatism. Never cutting on the cornea. And peel away this excessive amniotic tissue to an elegant outcome so these patients can literally wear their contact lenses next day or get ready for refractive surgery soon. Excess glue is removed using wax cells and immediate post-op appearance. This is her left eye we did, Kuro. And right eye one day post up. Please notice the comfort. Feels me Oh I'm believable. That looks great. Every patient is made to do the mirror text next day. Sherry, day one. They come out to see. So this is a very important thing. Every patient has a it's mirror test. Amazing. Yeah. Wow, on. I wasn't expecting it to be that clear. Yeah. Wow. And this is the this is the morning after. That's day one post up left eye. Yes, you're welcome. In cases of recurrent pterygium, the same principles apply. Intralesional anesthesia, anesthesia to also delineate the entire lesion. Cut down the scarred conjunctiva. Find the bare sclera that the previous surgeon must have prepared. It's and trace there. the entire pterygium from posterior anterior approach once again, finding its tentacles and cutting carefully but diligently till the entire lesion is removed in total. Literally, it comes into your hand as you cut the tentacles. You don't this have the to entire shot. lesion. At this point, also trace any evidence of previous leftover pterygium that can be removed. 
peel off the corneal scar. No cutting. Peel off, please. Using a blade, smoothen the cornea, the limbus, 64 and the blade. episcleral area. Use as an eraser. Smooth movements of the blade to smoothen the entire junction. Literally none to very minimal cartridge. None to very minimal cartridge. Very important. Clean the Use area the for the excessive tissue. Ready for receiving. High mag picture. Accept the amniotic graft, place it onto the you area. Can use different Glued into position, once again using the two Vexel technique to squeegee the graft. Now using a blade to trim the excessive amniotic graft at the limbus. Very minimal. And a simple, blue smooth leader. movement. Peel off this excessive amniotic tissue. Sweep the furnaces for any excessive glue that may prevent keratitis next day. Antibiotic drops. Immediate post op appearance of a recurrent pterygium. One day post op following a recurrent pterygium in her left eye. Again, Under please notice comfort, extracular movement. Wow, beautiful. Very clear. Yes. Come on. In case of pingicular intralesional anesthesia, once again trace the pingicular down to its roots to smoothen the limbus and episclera. Clean this area, prepare it for the amniotic graft that is received here, place into position. First component of the tissue glue delivers very subamniotically. Very Sweep it into glue. position with squeezing the amniotic graft simultaneously. Second component of the tissue glue, again, subamniotic delivery. Once again, sweep into place, squeegee at the same time so we have great adherence and placement and excessive glue removal. Sweep the furnaces. Using the blade, once again, trim the amniotic graft right at the limbus for a very elegant appearance and functional outcome. And vision. Peel off this excessive that, right? amniotic tissue. Do Wexel technique, squeezing the graft into position, removing excessive glue at the same time, testing that the graft is completely adhered. So we've had no graft slippage uh, in our series of cases immediate post-op appearance. <laughs> I never thought it would be possible. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm gonna be staring at it for hours now. <laughs> oh it's, amazing. it's amazing, it's amazing. The next day, the next day. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so good. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you so much. Whether it's a pingecular, early pterygium, or aggressive, recurrent pterygiums, a consistent next day outcome has been achieved with long term follow up. Patients of all ages, race, and sex have experienced these consistent outcomes of here today, gone tomorrow. All right, so we get back to our slides. Thank okay, can everybody see again? Yes, we are back onto the slides. So from that video, I would like to stop for a minute. What did anybody in the audience, any questions? The reason I want you to see these videos is, one, like I said, our mindset has to change. We want cosmetic looks. Second, when they're smiling and laughing like this, understand, for example, the last girl that you saw in the mirror came all the way from Vancouver, as she's a model. You can imagine the smile. It's also telling you how much they were hurting. So get addicted to this feeling. When I'm operating, I really am in a different zone. I'm actually seeing them see themselves in the mirror next day. That's how I operate on all my cases, whether it's a very complex LASIK, very difficult cataract. To me, in fact, the article I've just written, I call it, show me the patients. My point is I don't want to see anyone's surgical acrobatics doing things in the eye, crazy stitches and vitreous. Show me the patient is smiling, comfortable, wants to hug you, wants a picture with you. 
and is blown away with their vision. If they cannot show me that, I don't want to see their surgery. So that's the level I want all of us to be at, that I don't want anybody to show surgical acrobatics if the patient cannot be shown, because it's very easy for a doctor to say, I'm doing great or my patient's doing well. But a fully paid patient on camera wanting to say that they are doing great is the only indicator of success. So are you, are you with me till now? Now we'll go into the concepts. I call this sparkle concept acronym, suture, sterigium, amniotic reconstruction, lamellar keratectomy, excision. Never use burrs, never use blades on the cornea. Respect the cornea because that's vision. We cannot let vision go down. Three-step technique. First, you saw me in every case with a pingicula or pterygium. I was dissecting right up to the roots. That is vital. I believe that is the most important part of not having recurrences and the patient's doing so well. And of course, mitomycin C application in 100% of cases for 20 seconds, glued meaning sutureless, and the glue I use is to seal glue, no financial interest. I just want elegance. I hate stitches. I want the eye to look great, to move perfect, no pain, and the patient's vision is also restored to some extent. So this is how patients next day look. If you can notice the, uh, the lid area, it also has makeup. So patients go that far, even though you're constantly telling them to be careful. Next day, post-op of a pterygium and a pingicula. This is the iceberg concept. See the amount of lesion I remove compared to what most doctors remove. The small part actually is pretty big. It's the whole pterygium that was visible. But the entire large part is what was existing right up till the medial canthus. Then tissue grading. So I don't like to grade things as making it more difficult for me. I, I constantly teach these things because I do a lot of complex corrections. Don't call things difficult and complex. Grade it in your mind. In, in my experience, even a small pterygium, and I'm sure you've done many, you will notice this too, sometimes the small ones are much more gritty, like a raw pear, more difficult to remove than a large atrophic pterygium in an elderly population which peels off. So over experience, you learn to see that and you visualize in your mind how the surgery will go. Vascularity, very important. The more tortuous the vessels, the more active the lesion. Again, next day post-op is what I'm showing. You can see the BCL in this patient because they were flying. I just want to make sure they're fine before they go back to their doctors. No matter how aggressive the pterygium is, constantly, like I said, in my mind, it's how are they going to look at themselves in the mirror? Again, you see here lateral pterygium, no difference. Again, different kinds of pterygium, peripheral pterygium, pterygium that are atrophic, that are along the limbus. It doesn't matter to you. Don't go into the esoteric definitions of what's grade one, two, three. Look at it. Decide you want cosmesis, you want the same extent of surgery. Lateral pterygium, you can see again day one, and you can see the extraocular movement and everything reactive to that point. Very aggressive recurrent pterygiums that are sent to me. Again, I do not look at it. I don't call it recurrent or complex. My whole thing is I'm already visualizing the patient with a sparkling white eye next day and in the mirror. That's it. Again, aggressive pterygiums, recurrence that are sent over, you want it the same way. All against squamous cell carcinoma in lieu with the paleo surgeon who does also uh, therapies for them using uh, chemotherapies. But the surgery even I do, I still want cosmesis. Uh, a few things that I've seen as side effects in some cases, this was a bubble wrap sign I had seen uh, over 15 years ago, self-resoluting, uh, scleral melt, very minimal, patient was elderly and artificial tears and they were back. Patient has subamniotic bleed because they flew to New York after surgery, self-resolving. And the beauty is the amniotic membrane, as you can see, is containing the hemorrhage. It's a rectangle. And the tissue glue, guess what, is preventing the bleeding. So we are fine with it. Again, same concept here. This is how patients look in the mirror. Please get addicted to this look. It tells you how much they were hurting. And many of us, when we are not aware of these levels that we can take our patients to, are telling them that they're just being wane and it's no big deal when the pterygium will affect your vision or affect your lifestyle, come back to us. No, it's hurting them. When you first look at anybody, you look at their eyes and that's why you decide their personalities. And these patients are impacted, like I've described before. Low self-esteem, constantly self-conscious, even to the point of depression. That's why they're flying. Again, you can see here patients with multiple previous surgeries. This patient was from Oklahoma. You can see the unoperated eye, the extensive recurrent case, but still the same outcome. Very high recurrence, very high tortuosity, same thing. Patient, this was the other eye, the bitemporal pterygium in this case. Her vision was also 2200 because you can see it's nearly blocked and high astigmatism. You don't care. You want the same outcome. That's how she looks now and very excited. 
And this is the picture she took and she sent me when I uh, came back to her Oklahoma surgeon a few months ago. Uh, another patient, extremely aggressive, bitemporal, highly recurrent origin by the time she was sent to me, vision very poor. You see what we did here. Again, my plan is I want the cornea to be crystal clear, no cutting, please, no blades. You want to clear the entire phonics, restore the extraocular movements, increase the uh, phonics uh, sizing from the shortening, from the scarring. And in this case, I also fooled her conjunctiva by moving the upper lateral down and the lower portion out. So if you can see on the last section of the slide, and you basically give that tongue of vascularity for that extensive growth and yet confuse the conjunctiva in a seamed way so there is no chance of recurrence. And here you can see this patient today. Um, she actually runs one of the most amazing Thai restaurants and um, that's her cornea, perfect vision back to her profession. This patient I'm observing was sent to me after multiple surgeries. Uh, he had a scleral melt, a severe calcific uh, area with repeated uh, lashes and things getting stuck. In fact, I just did a surgery last month. He's doing very well. Again, I'm, I observed him for some time just to see if this was going to hold itself and it gets worse over time. So this particular doctor, I think they kept the mitomycin for too long and caused a severe scleral melt and then just left it. Now, uh, how do we correct scleral melt if it happens? Again, don't panic. The bigger thing, may I please request you again, is think about this patient in the mirror. It doesn't matter how complex they are. Think about them in the mirror. So this is a case which I used a lamellar cornea to fix this patient. Uh, she's a model and I placed it over there. I, I took some ex a tag sutures, two sutures up in the phonics, but otherwise glued it down uh, to give it a firm strength to the cornea and cosmesis. And here she is, uh, six years post-op. Now she's eight years post-op. Again, cosmetically perfect and very happy. Here's a patient with scleral melt where I use a Tudor Plus. You can use whatever uh, patch systems you want. I don't dwell too much on that. I want results. I want the same look in these patients. I want the same appearance, restoration of anatomy, clarity of cornea, and beauty of the eye. You can see this over here now. And there's another procedure where I've seen a lot of patients flying to us with complications uh, being used, uh, eye bright. These patients also come to us, some of them with scleral melts because of the medications that I use with it, some of them with severe complications of scarring. Um, patients, this particular patient I'm showing you to show you that actually they didn't have that much of a problem, but still the wrinkled look of his eye was something he couldn't tolerate. So we took that and we operated on this eye and you can see the smooth look now with the sutureless amniotic surgery and the patient is thrilled and flew back home after correcting his eyebrow complication. So these are those cases. Now you come to Procara is a technology uh, which I've used in extensive cases more to recreate the phonics area while my cornea is healing in these extensive cases. Patients recurrent uh, pterygium corrections. Again, these patients just adore you. They drive or fly back to you for years they, they don't want to go anywhere else for their post-op and it's fun. I mean, you just see them for a minute, there's nothing to see, but then I sit down and have lunch with them and it's very, very rewarding. So that's what I constantly say to people, uh, to eye surgeons, get addicted to your patient's love and appreciation because that's what drives you in surgery. Now, why are all these things important? Not only cosmesis, when you do pterygium at a level that you're excellent and consistently excellent, you can now attack pingecular because pingecular is a soft, smaller lesion. You can't afford to make a mistake, right? When you're doing surgery, today I do on patients who are 2020 because the SWAT teams and uh, uh, Navy SEALs who have flown to me, I want 2010 vision. But to reach 2020 consistently first is the step you must be confident about. So the importance of doing these surgeries cosmetically well is you are now able to do refractive surgery. You're now able to make them premium cataract surgery. Patients, candidates, so many patients of yours who deserved premium cataract surgery, laser vision surgery, whatever, keratoconus intact surgery, now are candidates because you haven't cut the cornea, you have restored the tissues, the eyes back to normal and precise for your accuracy. So here's a patient, we have to maintain their pseudophagic uh, vision to 2020. So you cannot harm it while you're removing the pterygium, very important. Here's a patient, we remove the pterygium, we put in a toric lens, bring them to 2020. Here is a patient you can put in a multifocal lens after pterygium because after you've done it the way I want you to, the patient is a normal patient expecting great vision at all distances. Here's another patient I want to show you the stages. 
not only was there a pterygium, it was all the way to the center. We did, we did a lamella filled with the amniotic, healed the eye, multifocal lens, and laser to 2020. Here's a patient which is, though it's a granuloma lesion, not so much a pterygium, the concept applies. You want perfection in the anatomy, then you are so accurate, you go and do an ICL surgery in this young man and bring him to 2020. Here's another patient, uh, a couple, uh, did pterygium on them years ago. Later, they came back and did multifocal lens for them. Now, at this point, they're about 12 years post-op, enjoying their life in the, at the age of 70, going skydiving. So you can change people's lives. It is important. That's the payback. Again, you see here, day one, outcomes of all these patients, just prototypes of patients from all over the world, different cultures, and how they are and what they see. Our study, a quick brief uh, overview of the study. Basically, we've had, I have seen midterm uh, issues in one patient distorted pupil, one patient discolored sclera, mild ptosis in one, self-resolved scleral thinning, amniotic, and one recurrence in our case series in this uh, study. These are patients 18 years post-op. Again, you can see them, different kinds of people from all over, different professionals, but the happiness and the consistency, that is very, very important to me. Uh, for those of you, we are building now a lot of my videos and surgeries on our Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. You're welcome to you know, go there or contact me or follow and uh, we can, uh, I can speak to you and uh, whatever questions you have, you can take that. So with that, I finished the slide pass and I want to give you time for discussion. I have tons of videos more, but let's take it to discussion so you can Q&A me. I call it grill me. Are we ready? Yes, uh, we'll go first with the chat questions, uh, Dr. Gulani. And sure. before that, uh, I would really like to thank you for this wonderful presentation. I think it was a great eye opener for all of us to think of a happy patient uh, post-operatively uh, as we are seeing at the mirror. And that is a real lesson to learn from you. And uh, so going on with the chat questions first. Uh, so first question was whether you use uh, mitomycin for all patients Yes, I do, for all of them, 100% of them. And the dosing is like 0.04% for 20 seconds, followed exactly. by a thorough watch. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there's one other question. Uh, how do you tackle the overlying conjunctiva? Should we cut or should it remain there? Yes, absolutely. You're cutting it, but not, basically you're cutting very minimal. So think about it when you saw the surgery, is I cut it in a C pattern, right? I look at the lesion. And again, I'm not looking at conjunctiva. Now my entire focus is I'm imagining the lesion like a complete iceberg going right up to the medial canthus. So I cut the conjunctiva maybe about four millimeters out from the limbus. And that portion I will throw away. The remaining you want nicely to drape over the amniotic tissue. You remove your pterygium from underneath all the way to its tentacles from the medial canthus. Bring it all out. It's over. No need for cartridge. There's no need for chopping. You're just cutting the tentacles gently and the pterygium comes in your hand because the tentacles are getting cut. So you remove the entire lesion, the whole mass, no cutting on the cornea, no burrs on the cornea, peel off the cornea. So you're maintaining vision, not inducing refractive errors. Then when you put the amniotic graft, you saw me in this C pattern, I let the remaining conjunctiva drape over it. Yeah, and how do you uh, avoid cutting the medial rectus? Oh, great question. So first of all, here's the first important thing I'll say on that, on that note, middle rectus, is the fact that you must see the middle rectus. Only then will I know that you have dissected all the way where I want you to. So you must see the middle rectus. Now in recurrent cases, you know the importance of that. You must see it isolated with the muscle hook to make sure anatomy is perfect. 100% of cases of recurrence, you will find the original pterygium there. That's the reason for it. So that's the one thing. Second, so identify it. Two, when you lift the pterygium off, cut vertically down, you'll never hit the middle rectus. If you cut this way, you'll get confused. So if you pull the pterygium in your hand, and even though you feel like, my gosh, I'm very close to the middle rectus, cut vertically down, and you'll never hit the middle rectus. The minute you cut the pterygium, you'll see a button holding happening. Middle rectus is a beautiful light brown look of the muscle glistening underneath. That's what you're looking at. So you will avoid it if you cut from up down. Okay, so that's great. Uh, so because you use mitomycin C in each of your case, uh, uh, how frequent do you see scleral melts as a complication? So in our series, like I said, I have not. I use it for 20 seconds and then I use a BSS flush the entire area with the BSS. 
I have seen some self-resolving sterile melt like I showed you there. And it has not been a problem in our study, also maybe because I don't use too much cautery. Uh, very rarely will I use cautery if I do want some area like in recurrence and stuff and I'm seeing a large blood vessel going around somewhere. But I believe, having seen patients that come to us, extensive cautery, a lot of mitomycin spread everywhere. I mean, mitomycin, when you're using, use it with a vexel, like five pieces, between the conj and tenons. I don't let it hit the sclera, if you saw in the video. And I keep a dry vexel in my hand. I just keep on drying the scleral area. I don't want it to go on the sclera. So that's first thing, making sure it's between the conj and the tenons. That's why anatomical delineation is very important. Two, 20 seconds. Three, avoid excessive cautery. I use the 64 blade if you saw in a very fast movement. When you use a blade fast, that's also my corneoplastic principle to remove scars from cornea. A fast blade acts like an eraser. It doesn't cut a chap. So that's how you uh, prevent a scleral melt. Okay. So one point to note is like avoid excessive cautery because we tend to see a uh, lot of bleeding during our pterygium surgeries. So do you follow any uh, specific medications, topical medications preoperatively? Yes, please. Yes. I should have mentioned that in the surgery. I do use a wax cell. You know, when I remove the pterygium, you saw me take a wax cell, which is dipped in epinephrine, and I put it straight into the medial angle. The reason for that is twofold. One, it has epi in it, so it may take, take care of the bleeding, if there is bleeding. Two, it's creating my space for the amniotic graft to go over the medial rectus. Now, when you see bleeding, here's what I teach uh, doctors all the time. I say, don't look at it. Doctors get so concerned and please take this the right way, about the bleeding. They're just going on and on cauterizing. If you've seen the blood in pterygium, of course, you shouldn't have more. How do I know you have no bleeding? Is It means your anatomy and the dissection was perfect, especially in recurrent cases. So this may sound controversial to you. In a recurrent case, actually, I want no bleeding because if you have bleeding, it means you chopped and cut and kept cursing the previous surgeon. In fact, the first thing I do in a recurrent case is find my scleral plane. So I hold the recurrence, I get down. The minute I see my sclera, home game. Because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift that entire plate of armor up. No bleeding. So if you see bleeding, number one, there's something wrong in the anatomy and dissection, the way it's being done. Two, don't bother too much. It will self-resolve itself. Keep working in your surgical area. Just dry it off. Use minimal cautery. Very important place. That was really uh, a good point to note. So when we are in the right plane, we see very little bleeding. Absolutely. I mean, that is, if I would say 100%, barring exceptions, if I see bleeding, my point is, doctor, you're on the wrong plane and you're chopping things. Do not cut. Just cut the tentacle, snip the tentacle. You saw me do that. The whole pterygium is coming off in your hand. That's very important. Okay. So the next question was... Uh, uh, because the post-operative first day pictures were like patients were absolutely without any lid edema or congestion or uh, no signs of inflammation. So what do you give post-operatively uh, the topical medications? Medication, sure. So steroid, antibiotic, and NSAIDs. Steroids for about four weeks, four, three, two, one. And uh, NSAIDs for about two weeks, anything you use. I use uh, Prolenza, Elevro once a day. Uh, antibiotic, I use uh, Best Advance, anything you can. Uh, steroid, I use the Durazol, but again, any steroid you want. Uh, so steroids for a month, NSAIDs and antibiotics for two weeks. That's it, pretty oh. much. Okay, so thank you so much. And uh, about the amniotic membrane, so all of your cases had amniotic membranes. So uh, you don't have the habit of using conjunctival autograph. Uh, if so, why? Right. So again, very important to me. I'm a stickler. I like beauty. Uh, I, I want absolute perfection in the eye. So the tissue that comes to me in my mind is I want something transparent that's glistening, that has ability to heal whatever ability it has to heal and can stick down with my glue. And I'm not damaging the remaining conjunctiva by removing it. Now, there's another practical point in some places. It's difficult, it's expensive to get the amniotic tissue. I understand that. So if someone's using conjunctiva, if you see, I don't get into these discussions about conjunctiva or what kind of amniotic tissue having used all of them, because to me, 90 plus percent of the success is still the surgery. Same things like I repeat, whether I'm teaching advanced LASIK or cataract techniques, 90 plus percent is surgery and the expectation that the doctor has to drive for. So even if someone's using conch graph, I have no problems. Make sure it looks beautiful, make sure it's staying in place and you haven't damaged too much of the donating eye. That's my point. Okay, so that's perfect. 
So one more question is uh, from Sonali Prasad. Uh, uh, sir, once I had nodular episcleritis below the pterygium. It got visualized only after removal of pterygium. I used a cautery to take care of the bleeding and scraped it off a little. What other technique could have been used? So, what's the doctor's name? Uh, Sonali Prasad. Sonali. Again, remember what I've said and spoken this full hour now. I don't care what you come across. I'll let that statement resonate with y'all. I don't care what I come across, how difficult the situation is, what I find under the rock. I don't care. I want the outcome in the mirror. I want the patient to look amazing, feel amazing, be blown away and flying off next day. So let's say you found nodular episteritis. Now let's think for a minute. It has nothing to do with your surgery. It's a problem. It's a problem which is a disease in the eye which needs treatment, most likely steroids or whatever. So what you did at that point, I'm okay with it, but it's two separate issues. Your pterygium surgery doesn't impact it. So you'll stay away from the scleral area there. You know you have to come back and do steroids or something for this patient. I'm all right if you cauterize it, but it's an unrelated discussion to the surgery. I still want the surgery to look like nothing happened. Okay, so that's right. Uh, one other question was, do you use BCL for all patients, bandage contact lens, and when do you remove it? No, I don't. I only use it when the pterygium was so far on the cornea that when I peel it off, you're obviously causing an epithelial defect. And that's when I would use the BCL for them to fly off to their doctors wherever they go. Uh, majority of the patients, I also patch these cases after surgery in case they are extensive, bitemporal, recurrent, and the patch already heals the epithelium by next day, as you know. So BCL is very rarely to be used now. Remember this other important point. We talked forward, let's talk backwards for a minute. We want to do these surgeries, not only for the patient to be cosmetically amazing, but to also turn them into candidates for your premium cataract, refractive surgery, look good, see good, right? 2020 plus vision. Look, think backwards now. Millions of people have had LASIK surgery or premium cataract surgery. We also have a responsibility to maintain that vision while we are doing our pterygium surgery. You cannot do pterygium surgery, cause distortion on the cornea, and now their vision is impacted poorly. So very important. So in cases where I find a LASIK uh, flap or a smile flap, I will put in a BCL for a day or two. That's the way I do it. So BCL is not needed unless there's epithelial defect. And then I would do it if I need to take extra care of someone's LASIK or smile flap or RK case, if you may, then I would for a day. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question was, when do you plan the cataract surgery after the pterygium excision is done? How long do you wait uh, for the refraction to stabilize? Same answer again as long as it may take. So I'm very patient, I refract the patients myself. It may, I first refract them at four weeks, then I go to eight weeks. By then they are pretty much stable, but I would wait about three months in most of these cases and do the surgery. Okay, so there's one other question from Dr. Murtuza. How much does this surgery cost for the patient? Does insurance cover it in US? So some of the cases are covered by insurance, but they have a very strict protocol, it has to be uh, pterygium, it's on the cornea, impacting vision, all those things have to be proven. Otherwise, the cost can range anywhere from uh, two to five thousand uh, dollars because of all the materials used uh, with the surgery. Now, amniotic tissue also, whether it's covered by insurance or no. So that's a different uh, discussion of uh, cost factor, insurance, non-insurance related. To me, the other important thing here is when a patient is discussing this with you is I like to talk about this as I spoke about this uh, when I was there at Arvind uh, three years ago, is the business aspect of these surgeries. Always, always believe that the patient wants the best and you want to give the best. I feel it's a misnomer that many doctors have that we must decrease our choices for the patients based on the cost. I have never found that to be true. You let the patient know exactly what you need for their surgery, they will plan it and they will afford it because it's important. Similar aspect of mindset for your refractive surgeries, anything you do in your practice. I have always found that to be true. And I repeat, the outcome further confirms that choice for that patient. Meaning, if you go to Tiffany, you're not looking for a coupon for the diamond. You're looking for the cut, carrot, and clarity. Give them the cut, carrot, clarity. Everything else is secondary. Okay. Um, so there's, there was a question from Dr. Damayanti. What is the rate of recurrence in your pterygium surgeries? 
So we've had one recurrence in 600 cases for the paper that we've uh, submitted right now. And I again believe, even though I use amniotic in 100% of cases, I believe the biggest point is the surgical dissection. Very important, very important. You know, I, I joke about this all the time when doctors are visiting, I say pterygium is something we allow our first year residents to do, right? In med school and uh, in, in, in medicine and in residency. In fact, it's the most difficult surgery I wanted to become. Think about it. I, I said this at the start for people just joining in. I see a lot of people now further joining in. Think about this. Even a plastic surgeon hasn't this level of accountability as an eye surgeon does. Think for a minute. You do any cosmetic surgery, you make one mistake, you cover it up with clothes, it's over. Nobody knows. You make one mistake with pterygium surgery, all your life, that patient and you are haunted. So as I said at the start of my lecture, number one, do provide these outcomes. It's what patients deserve. We have to perform. Two, it's tremendously gratifying. It comes with a little price that you're held to a higher accountability. But has that stopped you from performing advanced LASIK, advanced premium cataract surgery? All the surgeons here, I'm sure will say yes if I ask them, are you gratified that you, you do those surgeries? So yes, when you see your patients at 2010 vision, consistent, it should be addicting. That's the word I use, addicting. So when I'm operating, I don't even think about my surgery. I'm in a zone where I'm thinking, how will this patient look tomorrow and 18, 20 years from now. So I completely disregard my driving. I'm so focused on my destination and that my passenger should go at such a nice, comfortable way, listening to amazing music in the ambience of a phenomenal car. Last thing on my mind is surgery. Therefore, you see me in all my courses when I teach, the one thing I don't like is every surgeon teaches cooking, surgery. Nobody talks about outcome, patient experience, and consistency. That's where you have to be a master chef. Just not burning food is not being a good cook. Gourmet meal all the time that blows people away. So if we focus on pterygium surgery with that mindset, never look at the complexity or how large the pterygium is. Your mindset is, I want perfection in the mirror, painless appearance long-term, and if needed, refractive surgery. So these, this is the goals of today's talk and how we should get there. So any other questions? Yeah, so there's a question from uh, Dr. Manish Agarwal. What do you use for scraping the cornea? Scrape, uh, I don't scrape the cornea. I scrape the limbal area with the 64 blade as you saw me do it. Again, I have tons of videos for you. I'll put it on for you wherever you want. It's already on some on uh, our website, but I'll put it somewhere for you. I'll talk to you all later. But 64 blade, I use it at a very high speed. Extremely high speed. High speed because speed decreases the cutting aspect. It makes it more like an eraser. So if you see, if I see blood vessels on the sclera, you'll see me doing that over the bleeding and the blood vessels. And it's amazing, your sclera just clears off. And by not going slow, you're not cutting or chaffing. And similarly on the cornea, you don't want to scrape the cornea besides doing that. Now, any lesion on the cornea, I call it removal in a centripetal manner, meaning you lift off the pterygium, peel off the cornea. Use the cornea as a resistance guided platform. That's the concept here. So please avoid cutting. Never use burrs and stuff on the cornea. That's an insult to the cornea. Remember again, while I'm doing my surgery for pterygium, my mind is completely also focused on vision. Neither can I take away the vision that their refractive surgeon somewhere else must have corrected. Neither can I take them from the candidacy away of becoming a refractive or premium cataract. Okay, so the next question is um, from Dr. Aditi. Sir, in extensive limbal involvement in pterygium cases with minimal healthy limbus pre-op, have you experienced limbal stem cell deficiency? If yes, how are you planning preoperatively? Great. So again, different disease concept, but my desire doesn't change. If it's limbal stem cell deficiency, you can do the SLED technique. That is very easy to do. Again, you use the amniotic for it anyways. Do it combined with your pterygium, right? Cover the cornea with your amniotic, put some of the stem cells there, and go home with a BCL, of course. So my point again, please, I, that's an excellent question, but I want to come back to my mindset. That's what I'm trying to arm wrestle with you. I do not want you to get scared of what you see. I want you to be non-changing in your desire. 
So I don't care. You call it slut. Let's call it a tumor. Let's make it absolutely horrible. I don't care. I'm still visualizing that patient looking beautiful, sparkling eyes and in the mirror. So if you found something like that, I would address it along with the literature. And again, what would you do? You would do a slut for that and help that patient out, put in a BCL, monitor the cornea, but that's nothing changes. The medication doesn't change your desire. That doesn't change. Okay, so you'll be doing a combined procedure. Absolutely. Yeah. So now, one thing though, one thing, sorry, let me interrupt. When you say combine, uh, I get this question a lot too. Would you do that with cataract surgery? Would you do pterygium? The answer is never. Again, accuracy is your goal. When you're doing cataract and LASIK or whatever, among 28 different refractive surgeries, you want perfection. You cannot have perfection if you're doing two variable surgeries. So wait, perform. Unless the pterygium or pingicula is refractively neutral away from the cornea, there is no need to combine the surgery. Okay, so even if the cat cataract is very mature, you don't combine the surgeries? Absolutely. Again, if you see, uh, I'm, I'm repeating myself. Very important to me. I don't even call a cataract mature or white or whatever. I do some of the most complex cataracts that are sent to me. I have one 2020. I don't care what it looks like. So pardon me for using that language so strongly. I walk into the OR having researched about the patient, having met with them, having personally planned the night before, no rushing through. Surgery still takes four and a half minutes. Point is I want 2020 or better. I don't want anything less because that means I let her down. So even if it's a mature cataract, remember, we want accuracy. The first problem we have with mature cataract is maybe the IOL master A scans are off anyways. Now, if it's that bad, why add another problem of unreliable corneal astigmatism? So I would do the pterygium, monitor my cornea topographically normal, shape-wise constant. Now use all our energies and whatever 30 years experience to come up with the lens power. But to go in without that planning is disservice to the patient. Hence, I don't like words like complex because that decreases our desire to perform. Okay. So what's your take on using blood as a glue? So I've done that in some cases when we go and do outreach somewhere. I have no problem with that. Very, very, very innovative. I use blood. I'm fine with it. Again, my point, aim for the cosmesis end. And that question has a dual answer. One, you're using blood, I'm assuming for economic reasons, because the glue does work better in my experience, but using it, I'm not against it because I have seen blood holding it and adhering. So I'm absolutely okay with it. As long as it does, it's and holds it consistently. Okay, I guess we are done with the questions. Uh... You're done with questions and now it's morning, I'm awake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You have spread so much positivity and perfection into our minds. I hope that the lockdown is getting over soon and we're all getting a hands-on to a pterygium surgery as quick as possible. <laughs> you know, don't even, you don't even need surgery. Just sit in front of the mirror and tell yourself that's what you want. Like I say all the time, and this is very important, please. It's not the patient who knows what they want. It's you. Perform at a level even before you start your surgery. That's why I showed you the surgical ambiance, the way you sit down with the patient, the way you monitor and plan. It's not just showing up. Like I've said before, and these are numbers I actually give out. If cataract surgery takes more than four and a half minutes, you're doing something wrong, no matter how complex the case is. If refractive surgery takes more than three and a half minutes, there's someone doing something wrong. If there's bleeding in pterygium, there's someone doing something wrong. So if you monitor yourself with these principles, now, let me qualify this. I give 40 minutes per patient because of the way I want to treat them before, after, have fun with them, whatever. But surgery should be specific, not delayed. And no going into the eye and fooling around with things and stitching and vitreous, no way. Think of that patient as our family. They trust you, the eye is open, and you want perfection. Now, if, you, if we train our mind that way, that's the only secret I can give to anybody who asks me. I don't even think about the surgery. It's the outcome I'm completely focused on and the patient smiling and jumping off the table. So in fact, my article coming out in Ophthalmology Times next month, I've called it, Show Me the Patients. If you remember the Jerry Maguire movie, uh, Show Me the Money. My point is, anybody showing you these difficult surgeries and complex maneuvers, stop right there and say, hey, first show me that patient. Is that patient in pain while you did it? Did that patient get off the table and hug you? And three, is the patient 2020? If not, can you please shut the video? 
I want us to be that demanding of anybody who teaches surgery. Hence, I have done perhaps I think the most dangerous thing. All my patients are online and the qualifying factor is they've all paid for their surgery. They are the most, if not the most demanding patients in the world, in the world's most litigious country. The point I'm trying to share is, it's a pleasure to share with you that your patients are your tornadoes going out in the community. Why don't we perform at a level that blows them away? So even if we are in lockdown, there is no need to say I, I lost my surgical skills. No, just sit in front of the mirror, look at yourself and go, I'm gonna to deliver to each patient. Every patient will be perfect. There is no such thing as complex. There's no such thing as not a candidate. Everybody deserves our full attention and you are master surgeons. Take your mastery to the next level performance. So today's case uh, study of uh, the lecture was mostly Kirijim, everybody does so well. Cosmetic level, visual level, look good, see good. Performing at that level consistently, not getting afraid, scared, uh, intimidated by looking at difficult scenarios. Care a damn for it, just perform. Thank you so much, Dr. Bilani. I guess the questions are uh, over. Uh, I hope there are no audio questions. Uh, so if that's so. I see some chats coming in, but uh, why don't you ask the audience, uh, what is their take and what has been their success in this surgery? Because I'm sure someone else has another great idea. Hello. I can't hear. So we're not able to hear you, uh, Dr. Anita. I'm looking at the chat while I'm waiting. I think I've answered all of these questions. Minimal redness and good vision for me. So this is Sonali, okay. Yes, not minimal, no redness. Uh, audience, any other uh, questions do you have? You can come on online, the Zoom audio. I can't hear. Um... Dr. Anita, John, we're not able to hear your audio well. Can you increase the volume? I can't hear. Um... Dr. Anita, if you're not audible uh, in the Zoom audio, you can chat with us for your question. Okay, there's someone asking in the meanwhile, do you, what's your take on cataract surgery outcomes? Do you still perform monovision? Yes. So what's the answer to that? Can you hear me? Yes, we're able to hear you. I think that, that was a question by Dr. Murtuza for you. Uh, do you still perform monovision? Okay, great. So, Let's again, this is a whole different discussion, whole different lecture. Um, monovision, yes, but my point is that's not a question. I want the best vision for that patient at all distances and see what they are comfortable with based on my testing for them, including understanding their fusion capacity, the needs for night vision and 3D. So to me, again, I don't talk about things like monovision, multivision, whatever. There are 30 lens implants that are there available to be used so lens is just an ingredient in the recipe of vision. So everything, like my cataract talk, like the pterygium, we can go through systems later, is everything from your planning to your diagnostics, how do you land at the goal of vision? If the request of the patient, having proven that they like monovision, absolutely you can do that, sure. Okay, Dr. Bulani, so that was a wonderful session we had this evening, and it was a completely different outlook uh, for us. 
uh, to treat our patients in a very higher level and to think of a happy patient. And uh, we'll get addicted to this word of being uh, thinking of a happy uh, patient. And uh, we'll be waiting for more talks by you uh, in the near future if our lockdown extends. And thank you once again for this amazing session. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much. You.